different pieces of the puzzle because it's a big picture with many pieces so this one is about collaboration because let's assume that everyone in the room is doing great things and is really passionate about this like I said about pushing the car out of the snow if you're not all pushing at the same time you might be really strong but you wouldn't be producing a collective impact. So we want to, we want to produce a collective impact, and I just have, I, I always love talking to y'all because I have great examples. So Thomas and I were talking, because Thomas is a supervisor in Adult Protective Services, so he's dealing with a lot of cases. And I'm talking about what are the scenarios for bystander intervention? What are the warning signs? What are the triggers? Who are the bystanders could intervene? And he has like a zillion great stories. They're not great stories, but they're great for this purpose. But if he only stays in his office, right, he could get, he could write the best annual report in the world and get all kinds of awards from his, his piece of the puzzle, but he's not helping me, and he could help me so much. So it's like, how do, we, how do we circulate around and share what we all know so that we can help all each other see the big picture and give each of us the information that we need to, to be better at what we do. And I really need Thomas in this case because, you know, in the sexual assault prevention field, I started going to a conference where there are a lot of cops and there are a lot of lawyers and advocates or even forensic nurse examiners. And like, that helped me understand prevention so much because they were all dealing with the stories. So that's really what we talk about when we're talking about collaboration. And since this is a smaller group, please feel free to raise your hand or ask a question or give an example. As I said, most of the, this is based on what's happening in the sexual assault prevention field where they have really good collaborative efforts, which it seems to be you have here in Syracuse, and they're what are called sexual assault response teams in communities. And the government, this is what we need for elder abuse. Because in sexual assault, the government has been funding these teams to be developed. And they have law enforcement, they have legal, they have medical, they have, camp, they have all the people sitting around the table. Well, nobody's giving you all any money for that yet, right? So that's, we need to get that money. So you start doing that even if you're doing it already with more supportive resources. They are actually starting to fund. They're starting, great. <coughs> so the question would be, to what extent do you know about each other's efforts? So, if Thomas has all these great stories, but he doesn't know what I'm doing, he doesn't know that he can help me out. Right? With his stories. That would help me identify the warning signs and the bystander triggers. Do you talk to each other regularly? Do you collaborate on programs that use a common framework? So, for example, you can approach almost any issue from a bystander perspective or a social norms perspective. So, if different agencies with different populations are using common frameworks, you're mutually reinforcing each other. Whereas, if one agency is using fear, you have to find a way to have a conversation with them without putting them on the defensive because they're doing that because they really care, but they might not know that it doesn't work. As opposed to all of us gossiping, all of you gossiping about what I'm doing that you think isn't any good, as opposed to somebody having a conversation with me. Do you strive to be proactive, which is what prevention is all about? Now, I'll just keep using you as an example, Thomas, because I appreciate the conversation. Anyway, he's an old timer, so he's, he's an easy. So, because he worked in child protective before even this. So, um, if Thomas knows what I'm doing and we have opportunities to talk to each other, he has an opportunity to provide me, share with me things that he knows that could help me. And then we need to have a common framework because 
maybe in some of the response situations, you're not evaluating the cases from a prevention point of view and saying, who are the bystanders, who could have mean, who knew, who could have said something to someone. But if you take back time to work the case backwards, there's a great sexual assault prevention video where this, it's like a stereotypical situation. This young woman goes to a party, there's alcohol, this guy offers to take her home, and in the end it's like an assault that's going to happen. But then they run the whole video backwards and they show at each point there were the bystanders. And then they have a discussion about how those bystanders could have intervened. So how do we do that for elder abuse? And what is the collective knowledge that we all have together that would allow us to do that? And are we sitting down together and doing that? That's what I'm talking about is collaboration. So if we look at a comprehensive program, we have policies, procedures, and enforcement. So there's a law. It's implemented. And people are hopefully busted when they break the law. That's important. Mm -hmm. We have. Services for victims, no question, right? So we're, we're already doing that to a large extent with elder abuse, but are we doing prevention and risk reduction? And as I, I said in the last session, but some of you might have been there, if you teach someone to reduce their risk, like there are successful workshops that teach women self-defense, how to identify perpetrators, how to identify risky situations, how to handle them, and to not blame yourself if you get assaulted. And the women who take that workshop are less likely to get assaulted. Very good statistics. So that's called the risk reduction workshop. But if this side of the room has the workshop and sexual assaults go down, you're the same over here. And if I, if I can't get away with it over here, I'll get away with it over here. Mm -hmm. So risk reduction is not prevention, but we still have a moral obligation to provide risk reduction for the populations that are at risk. Does that make sense? But it's not prevention. Like what adult protective services are doing is not prevention, but it's absolutely necessary. But if we really had good collaboration, it could fuel prevention. So a successful program is comprehensive. That means it involves all the key parties. So if I'm asked to present to athletes, I always ask to talk to the coaches. If you do work in the, in the elementary school, you need to find a way to engage or inform the parents. So what is comprehensive for elder abuse? I'm thinking out loud, it would involve involving the neighborhood. It would involve involving the gatekeepers. It would involve involving the financial sector. And it would involve giving non-confidential information to people to arouse their suspicion. So in case you weren't in the last session, what's your name? Taylor Hazard. Charlie gave a great example of she's a caretaker. And she might notice things, and how could she? Some of it might be confidential. And so we gave the example if I'm the caretaker for my mom, and Taylor notices that I'm spending a lot of money, and I got a new car, and I all of a sudden have a fancy, nice watch, and I'm dressing better, mm -hmm. and then my brother comes to visit my mother, she can't say something that my mother told her in confidence, but she can say to my brother, Adam, did Alan get a new job? <laughs> Seems like he has a lot more money in his pocket. Impacting the causes, so what are the causes, and changing the environment. Those are the pieces of prevention. And fostering inclusiveness and prevention and response, which is not only inclusiveness in terms of us collaborating and inclusiveness in identifying other issues, but also inclusiveness in terms of making sure that our services are relevant to all the populations that need our help. And when you get to the later stages, it, the first stage doesn't go away, <clears throat> but it's more where we're focusing most of our energy. So you all invited me to come because some folks felt that you need to focus now more on expanding the scope to prevention. That's why I'm here. And one day you won't need me. Okay. 
Stages three and four. You need the prevention stage. You need collaboration. You need relationship building. If I'm in stage one, which is confrontational and adversarial, and we're doing demonstrations and sit downs, I'm not trying to build a relationship with you, <laughs> right? I'm trying to get like the world's attention. Mm -hmm. But now we're sitting on a task force, like in the old days of rape prevention, law enforcement and advocates didn't really get along. And you know, the rape prevention person were coming in, the law would say, oh, there's the rape lady. And there's all these stories. It was a little bit adversarial, but now everyone's totally on the same page. Law enforcement totally gets it. They want to solve this problem just as much as anyone else. So you need to build a relationship. You need to manage conflict, because we don't always agree. Thank you. I was just wondering if you think that this is linear, because my sense when you talk about some of those social justice movements, and you look at just the last couple of years, or five years, it seems like we've had to move back to some of the earlier stages, because we've recognized that we're not where we thought we were. Maybe in terms so of I like to think of it more like a spiral. Yeah. And the spiral has a, a slope. So some spirals go like this, <laughs> where it seems like you go way back, and then you go ahead. But if there's unfinished business, then you have to go back. And there's always unfinished business, so it's also like a pendulum. So it's good to have that bigger perspective of how the dynamics work, because when we need to go back to our unfinished business, it's easy to get depressed. Mm and think like, oh, we're not making any progress, but you're making so much progress that you, all the dirt came out. I mean, did you ever move your refrigerator and see what's up there? <laughs> <laughs> now you can clean it and it's not there, you know, but it's like you never had time. So it's a process. Um, I was listening to what you said about collaboration. Yes. And um, when I'm out and about talking in the community, one of the things I talk about is Collaborations is important to take away some of the weapons that people use to abuse. For instance, uh, an elderly woman leaving her door unlocked because she can't really hear the doorbell. And she said, well, it's okay, only my family knows, but no telling who her family mm -hmm. knows. So now the community knows that this woman leaves her door unlocked. Right, and they can come in. Not knowing that there are services available to someone like her that is a, a flash, you know, right. what? That but you can carry around with her. Thank but you. if we don't talk to each other to say, That's well, the point. you know, That's that this is available. And for instance, I need this person in my life, even though they're ripping me off, because I need them to fill out my checks. But then they don't know there's large print checks, there's check guides, there's other things they can do. But having a collaboration with other people in the community, so you can tell that person, no, actually, here's something else that can help you where you won't be as vulnerable or, or whatever, but having a conversation and, and building relationships Thank can you. help. Yeah, so going back to your example, which is really a good one, the person leaves the door unlocked, and many people have different pieces of information. And so, like I have a friend who's deaf, and she just she was out of the country. She asked me to buy her a special alarm clock that really vibrates. Mm -hmm. So that's how she wakes up, because she can't hear the alarm, but she can feel the vibration. I know something I experienced a lot, like in talking with different professionals in different sectors, that you know, people do have different compassion and empathy and it's even I feel a responsibility when I'm speaking with somebody to educate them even have that conversation about compassion and you know just passing the message on because at that point I would technically be a bystander if you know let's say if somebody was in a nursing home and the head nurse wasn't really using a compassionate model and dealing with that client I think that would serve, you know, as my responsibility to have that conversation and say, you know, where are we at, where are we going, how are you feeling? Or even if there's a recognition of personal issues, like what upsets you so much about this kind of patient? Now, if you go back to my introduction in the keynote, how we're all programmed to think we have to be physically fit, beautiful, by what standards, right? I mean, why are people dying their hair blonde? Because somewhere along the line, somebody thought that was more beautiful. 
Please don't take anything personally, but it's like we're talking about the culture. It was Sunday night, it was right. Cool. We're talking about the culture. <laughs> Came out this way. <laughs> and like I said, if you were in the last session, we were talking about if you know what you're doing and why you're doing it, and you're doing it for well thought out reasons. Like someone said, I tell my mother to dye her hair because people will treat her with more respect. Mm -hmm. If that's why you're doing it, that's a good reason. But if you're doing it because you're taught to be ashamed, you know, of being old and vulnerable, and we're doing all these things, then I could be compassionate to a person with Alzheimer's, because I'm afraid that one day I'm going to be like that, and I'm not. I'm going to die, right? Everyone's going to die. We don't talk about. We don't. We don't deal with death. I mean, I'm not recommending any one religion, but if you're a Buddhist monk or a Hindu monk, they send you to the cemetery and they ask you to meditate in the cemetery. So like you can work through your issues with death, <laughs> right? And we run the other way. So if I'm afraid of it all and I'm not dealing with it and I'm getting a little older, right? Then I'm not going to be compassionate towards the person with Alzheimer's because they're triggering all my fear. Isn't that part of that self-care too for yourself and for the totally. population you're dealing with? Because part of that is dealing with your fears is that self-care, yes. how to get over that. Right, so we need to make time for me to take care of myself, which is for maybe you're my friend and you notice I'm getting triggered all the time, and maybe you have time to sit down with me and say, like, Alan, what do you think of so-and-so? And then you could get to the point where I'm afraid of being like that, and why am I afraid of being like that? And then we could get to the point of, well, how does that affect how I relate to someone who is like that? Mm -hmm. So we also need to help each other with our self-care issues. That would be a great collaboration piece that I didn't think of. <clears throat> In elder abuse, we know there's more reasons for people to not want to tell on the abuser. <coughs> and we know that, for instance, in sexual assault and other issues, there's more disbelief of the victim report, like in sexual assault, a huge issue is disbelief and belief in false reports. But we still need to remind ourselves that people are almost always telling the truth, and we always start by believing. When someone tells you something, if it's a bystander, a family member, or an elder, you always assume it's true until proven otherwise, and you go forward with the assumption that it's true to find out if it is true. Okay. And if someone's being accused, you also have to treat them as innocent until proven guilty. And both of those aren't true at the same time. Mm -hmm. But you have to assume that I'm innocent until proven guilty, but you believe everything someone told you about me unless okay. you have proof that it's not true. Victim satisfaction is in everyone's interest. Are we clear about what we're trying to do, why we think it will help, and how we will measure it? And we must be accountable to elders and include their input. So, I forgot which resource in the other room, but I was checking out all the tables, and some of the tables were providing resources, and they were saying this was developed with the input of elders. Because you can't help someone if, if they don't think you're helping them, right? <laughs> If I want to end racism and I'm not doing things that folks of color think is helping, then I'm not doing what I think I'm doing. Same for, there's, in the rape prevention field, there are some well-known popular rape prevention for men programs that on every campus they go, they alienate the advocates. That something's wrong. I know. I have a comment. Actually, like I just a scenario to get your opinion. Um, regarding bystander intervention scenario if if you are on a central bus transportation and young people are together they see elder person trying to get on the bus with a walker or a cane taking their sweet time you know um, taking a hard time to get their money out kids talking oh, you know I got somewhere to go this doesn't make any sense and everyone's on the transportation bus quiet no one intervenes what would you have done? Well, what I've usually done is what I thought of later, right? But, <laughs> but what happens is you keep doing it and then you do it in the moment. So first of all, I would, actually anonymous situations are the hardest, like mm -hmm. public situations. So first of all, I would have to ask, do I feel physically safe? 
I would probably do an indirect transfer and I'd say, are you all in a big rush? Mm -hmm. Seems like you need to be getting somewhere. <laughs> and that would probably chill them out right away because they're probably not in a rush. And I'll say, then I might say, you know, we're going to get there at the same time anyway because the bus is on the schedule. Right. So if, if, they, if she slows them down, the bus driver is going to drive fast. And if you get to the next stop and we're ahead of time, the bus driver is going to wait longer. In other words, I try and have a conversation, but come in because you all have to help each other figure out how are the different ways that you could respond to these situations that don't like have an obvious help. If the nursing home knows something that you don't know, you need to know it. If you know something that they don't know, they need to know it. And if they're trying to make the bottom line and hold on to people longer than they should, then it's a different bystander intervention, right? Because then it's a little bit on the malpractice side. So you have to work the situation and get the information. And two different situations might have a different conclusion. One situation might be, oh, now I understand why I don't want to let that person home. And you let it go. Another situation might be, oh, now I want to, you know, like take me. Now I understand why you don't want us to bring our daughter home, but what we found this doctor that'll do what you need. Okay. And then the third, so you see, it's not one situation is all the same. But when you're in the collaborative, like maybe you don't know if what they're telling you is the truth. So you need to talk to a medical person. So then it becomes a collaboration, so we could do a role play if we had time. We could be inside of a scenario and I could say, well, what do you need to feel that it's safe for this person to go home? And you right. say, I need this, this, and this. And we could all do that, no problem. That's what we're designed to do. And I would say, well, I think this person would really rather be home, and their family wants a home. So let me see what I could work out. And then I come back to you and I say, here's what we came up with. And then you ask me a few questions. And then he realizes there's a missing piece. So that's collaboration. But in many cases, all those resources aren't there, and the person needs to stay in the nursing home. Absolutely. But we need to know. We all need to know that so we don't get mad at you. And we're almost done. What would a comprehensive elder abuse prevention response program look like? What would you need to change in order for this to happen? I need to go talk to some nursing home directors to find out why I think they're so slow. <laughs> You know, whatever. <laughs> well, we need to meet every month and work cases, right? And one month we work a discharge case. How would you go about making this a reality over time? Because it won't happen all at once. What are your personal goals in terms of relationship building? And I would also add, what are your triggers? Like, what pushes your button? Yes? I just want to say, this whole, over this whole nursing home issue, too, I think that there's a bigger environment where we don't um, have good supports for people in the community. I mean, it's it, you know the nursing home is limited by the supports that the person can get when they're discharged. And, right. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. So like I, I don't think I said this yet about my wife being from Brazil. They don't have. Did I say that here? Mm -hmm. You said it real well. It was the third time. <laughs> so. In the U.S., the way we understand family may cause us to over-rely on nursing homes. And maybe if we thought about family differently and provided family more resources, more families could support their elders. But in Brazil, it's the opposite. The way they understand family is you get trapped in these dependency guilt-ridden relationships where you feel you're a bad person. I mean, I had a really good friend our friend who was Brazilian, and his mother was really mentally ill and irresponsible, and he couldn't allow himself to say no to her. And it was part personal, but it was very cultural. So we need to look at all these layers. That's why that original, in the keynote, I should have put it in here, that diagram with all the circles. Right. You need to look at all the circles and what each piece is contributing and how they all fit together and get them lined up so they're working together. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.